Uh, so, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, day of Action. Uh, I'm Mark Vardy, it's Kara Brook. Um, this is going to be a very interactive space. Uh, we're not going to do much lecturing at all. Uh, we've got a series of case studies that we're printing off, and then we're going to ask you to sort of discuss in pairs or in small groups and then have report back uh, to, uh, to the large group. Uh, so we were sort of like really crowdsourcing a, a sense here, trying to get like a sense of uh, a dialogue uh, uh, that are going. Um, so we have some things that we would like to contribute to the conversation along the way. Um, but when we were thinking about how we best want to do this, we really sort of want to embrace the, uh, the, the, the day of action. And so rather than have us do all the lecturing, we're going to be inviting you to be uh, getting up, perhaps moving, talking, speaking, and thinking, contributing to the overall dialogue. So just by way of introduction, um, I'm a postdoc uh, in uh, the Houston Environmental Institute. My background is in sociology of scientific knowledge. So I'm interested in how scientists actually come to know what it is that they know, and then communicate that to other uh, publics, particularly policy makers. Um, do you want to Sure. Um, I'm Kara Brook. I'm a fifth year PhD student in ecology and evolutionary biology. I study bat virus coevolution uh, and the spread of and emergence of infectious diseases, but I'm quite interested um, more broadly in how science is communicated and turned into policy. Cool. So do we want to, when we're, when we're planning this event, uh, one of the things we realized is that we're not going to know who our audience is. We don't know what backgrounds you uh, have or what areas you're um, experts in yourselves. So why don't we do a quick whip around? Um, or we could even just do it by a show of hands, uh, just to keep things moving. Um, yeah, okay. So if I said, like, how many of you are, are working in the natural sciences, either as a student or as a professor? Okay, so probably, so, okay, and then how about the social sciences? Okay, how about uh, humanities? All right, how about uh, citizens who are, are not affiliated with Princeton right now? Excellent. Um, any large categories of belonging that I did not <laughs> name? <laughs> Administrators. <laughs> Administrators, okay. Librarians. Librarians, great. Uh, any others? Okay, so we've got a wonderfully diverse group. That's fabulous. And so, in, in keeping with the fact that we're uh, in a women's uh, in the women's center, and we're also talking about mobilization, I think it, 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 uh, we should sort of like honor the traditions that we're pulling on here, like feminism and civil rights movements, and just to say, you know, me speaking up here as a white dude, I recognize that there's like sort of uh, uh, privilege that's involved with that. That, that knowledge and power are inextricably linked, and that because this is a day of action, no one has any right to tell you what you can do with your body. And if you want to get up and go, get up and go, please. Okay. <laughs> so, um, that said, do you want to introduce the first exercise? Yeah, sure. So, the title of our workshop is Are Facts Political? And this sort of came about just based on a few conversations that Mark and I were having, um, where we realized that this was actually a difficult question to answer. Um, and so we're going to start off by breaking up into small groups, two or three. So uh, get with a partner and just jot down for a few minutes a few notes, and then we'll come back together and share. But I'd like you all to talk about um, how, you would define, how you would define fact, what we mean, what is meant by political, and give one example of a non-political fact, if possible. One example of a non-political fact that has become politicized. And then one example of a fact that is inherently political. So just a, a basic starting point for this discussion. Um, obviously, you might not get to all of those, uh, those points, but um, we'll give four minutes. Um, so please talk to your neighbors, and, and we'll start 
Okay. Yeah, and this is this is going to be we're going to do a bunch of these like exercises. So thank you. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people here, which is fabulous. So let's just uh, shout it out. We don't have to go around in any particular order. And feel free uh, to squish in too yeah. if you're. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so first on our list, we just asked you to think of a fact, like not a fact, but how would you define fact? Are there any uh, anyone who wants to jump in with that? How would you define what is a fact? Measurable. De depends. Sorry. Measurable. Depends on the field. Depends right? on a mathematical context. fact is different from a scientific fact, and so on and so forth. Context how, is important. What we mean by the word fact depends on on the field. Right? Yeah. Totally. Yes. Conclusion that can be proven from a set of principles. Okay. Principles. Which presumably presu principles are going to vary depending on what you're doing. We're physicists. Okay. But you use the word proven. Actually, I can tell you. If you're a physicist and you use the word proven, that's curious. Okay. Um, this is how we work. <laughs> <laughs> no, mathematics works that way. <laughs> any any uh, contributions from out in the, the room out there? Uh, how would you define fact? Verifiable from different sources, awesome. Well, thank you. Uh, Does anyone think that there are not facts, that they're not real? Well, I went to a talk this morning where they said there are no facts. So. Joel? So, I, oh, I, well, I, don't, I can't defend it, I, just don't, I don't know. I'm going from the negative in that I can't define a fact. I have no idea how you define a fact. I mean, like saying the sky is blue is a fact, right? But what is blue? Because blue is how our eye interprets the wavelength that comes through the atmosphere. So is that blue? This is a good question. I mean, I'm not going to answer that question for you. <laughs> Part of the purpose of this exercise is to think when we get to the end of the workshop in, you know, 47 minutes, has, do you, have you heard alternative? Oh, <laughs> Is your thinking about facts the same as it was when it came in, as well as when we get to speaking about the politicization of facts, are you still thinking about facts in the same context? So these are, are, are this is sort of a generative portion of the discussion, rather than answering hard philosophical questions like that. Um, and can we come up with instructive improvements on our definition of fact, right? So, yeah. We said that you use the word fact when you want to say that it's not something political and controversial, that it's something shared, that there's a consensus about it, that it's known. So that fact is specifically a non-political. Non by definition, non-political, right. Which is interesting, because that almost kind of, like that, that work of like distinguishing it from the political is almost like a political act. <laughs> right, right, it is. Yeah. Perfect statement. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So political, what does that word mean? Yeah, Chris. I would say something that is used by people to gain power. Are people inherent in the definition of political? I would say so. I would agree with that too. Okay. So if you could mm -hmm. rabbits. Could be rabbits. Are there other ideas for like how to define <coughs> what's political? So I really like that in that I think that a fact can be political, both active manipulation, but also just a presentation, right? Um, the, the interpretation is equally important as, the, as but, the presentation. But is what you're saying that what is defined as political uh, can be uh, context dependent? Like, uh, that it's diff interpreted differently depending on where a person is in society? It certainly can be that. Uh, we were discussing that it could be political can fall in any environment, even a family or a you know, a work environment. It doesn't it doesn't have to be government. It can be any part of society. Right. So right. yes. Yes. I guess. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um anyone else? Yeah? Uh, I think the political tends to tend tends to depend on the scale of the number of people that inv it's in, are involved. Like something can be if it's one per, if it's two people, it's much harder to be political than if it's fifteen people. Um, but right. like this, uh, 
it's, uh, offices can be po very political. It's uh, sometimes more or less difficult, depending on the scale of the office, to see those political differences. It's like, okay, if I'm working in an office with five people, they those be those become obvious very quickly. If I'm working in an organization with several hundred people spread out, the differences can themselves. Right. And I, I, I mean, I think that this is like a really, these kind of ideas connect really uh, in an important way. And maybe it's because we're in the, in the Women's Center. Uh, I'm thinking of the example of like, when you look at the history of like how spousal assault was defined, uh, there was a particular work that the uh, uh, feminist movement did in giving uh, a vocabulary to name it. And then what became, what was previously like a, a private issue, then became a public issue, and then it became a public like a, a political issue because it had a name and people could start talking about it, right? And so that's a way that this, um, you know, how politics is not necessarily only the sort of sphere of formal electoral politics, but that it operates uh, also on other levels as well. Uh, yeah. So I don't know that I believe or understand this idea, but I've encountered this in various contexts, the idea that essentially everything is political. Following on what you're saying, that essentially what isn't political uh, that that's an interesting sort of thing that I am sort of struggling with. Right. Yeah. So it's well, everything is political. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, we're going to address yeah, this. Sure. <laughs> sure. 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 I think natural scientists still hold on um, to the view that there is objective reality and that facts are properties of a, are, are, are individual properties of an objective reality. And and I think that a lot of people. I think the average person in the world also believes this to be true, all right? And so facts are simply properties of, a, of an objective reality, and political facts are not. Well, we were having a conversation on the topic of immunization mm -hmm. and trying to define what was factual within the context of does immunizing your child have a net benefit, which is quickly became not facts, and it, we ended up falling into a conversation like statistical likelihoods and for both directions, like getting benefit from the organization, minimizing side, you know, so I don't know if that's in line with your what you're saying, or? I, I think so. There's, there, there's a, we, and, we should, should we probably move on to the um, case study? Oh, but, sorry, but I guess I, I do, did. Just quickly though, I want to respond to uh, Stephen Color, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Steve. Steve. Okay. Uh, there's a, a, a philosopher of science who sort of distinguishes when I mean, you're talking about the, um, you know, like the, the, the realm of sort of like the, what the natural sciences study and then politics, which would be sort of like the more the realm of the, the social. And uh, he distinguishes between these two by saying that the behavior of the natural objects that the natural scientists would study do not change, does not change depending on how you categorize it. But there's instances in the social and political world where behavior does change depending on how you categorize it, because that leads to how we interpret the world. Um, and I think also, what's your name? Natasha. Natasha. What Natasha was saying, um, science is process, right? And facts might even be outside of science, but science might be the process in discovering these facts or communicating these facts. So science could be political and in discussing immunization or trying to um, trying to put vocabulary to these facts, we might make them so. So our, our, our relationship with facts might be inherently political even if facts themselves are not. So just really quick, um, did anybody come up with a non-political fact? <laughs> Water boils at 100 Celsius. Nice work, Charlotte. Uh, any political implications? At what atmosphere of pressure and Celsius is defined? As that, right? So that's, there's no information about that. Yeah. Um, there's a table in this room. True. True. So there are. There are there are incontrovertible truths that uh, God is good. Potential. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, fact, non-political fact that has become politicized. Probably thousands came up. Any quick examples? Crowd size. Crowd size. Yeah. <laughs> True. The, the fact 
there is controversy as well. Yeah, I, uh, until recently, was teaching uh, sort of library instruction in social science. I usually used to start off with that there are eight, about eight million people who live in New York City, but that's inherently politicized. I realized because because of the Census Bureau, it's necessarily an estimate rather than a fact. Or if there's a difference right, and there's probably political disputes over what defines New York City, and um, yeah. Um, and then an inherently political fact. This would be kind of contradictory to what Steve said, if there is a fact. So the first paper describing nuclear fission, is that inherently political? Nope. <laughs> um, how about the, um, that uh, the higher your educational attainment in the United States, the more likely you are to be politically liberal rather than politically conservative. It's a fact about the political system that always has political content. Kind of coming back to what Mark was saying, that a lot of these sort of social science research findings are inherently politicized. I would agree with that. What about like crime has gone up or crime has gone down? The crime rate is doing things that we Yeah, I mean, I think that that goes back to the point that was made earlier that, you know, like, it, it really depends upon the social context and, and the, um, the, uh, uh, the way in which you want to interpret these facts and, and give meaning to them uh, is going to change, like, even how you read them, right? Um, so let's jump into, we have, uh, just aware of, like, you know, time is moving on. We want to, uh, we've only got about another half hour, 35 minutes. So um, we're going to jump into, like, a specific case study. Uh, that we're going to pass around. So I think we only have about 20 copies of these. So you're going to have to get into groups of two or three. Um, we've, what we've done, Rupert Kara has like isolated um, a series of newspaper articles. Do you want to just give us like a... Yeah, so the first scenario, um, just to set the stage, uh, in 2012, um, a series of uh, molecular biologists, virologists, um, genetically mutated a strain of flu virus um, so that it had five simultaneous mutations, uh, a strain of avian flu that allowed it to be transmissible between ferrets. Um, their research was shut down because of the political implications that this could be a bioterror weapon um, prior to publication, then eventually their study was published uh, in the journal Science. Um, then later uh, funding from the National Science Foundation was restricted towards that line of work while the government reviewed, um, reviewed the pros and cons of this sort of research. They were a lab that worked on vaccination, two simultaneous labs in uh, Madison, Wisconsin and in the, uh, the Netherlands. Um, so there's a compilation of articles um, and a few question points that I'll write on the board as well uh, relating to those articles. Um, so just take five minutes to sort of skim those articles um, and try and understand um, what the appropriate scientific response would be in this scenario, um, whether this is an inherently political fact, these findings, uh, and how we sort of weigh the pros and cons of these different news sources. Um, so, is this inherently political science? Does anyone have an opinion on that? I'll bet Steve thinks no. Well, I don't want to lead up because I'm going to, because I'm a white male and I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> go I'm going to say yes. yes. If, if by political we mean that something that affects the power relations. Yeah. Right? So I think the clue for for me at least was for us was this comment by this other epidemiologist current power yeah. who says, you know, the report exaggerates the benefits while it's outweighing the risk. Yeah. So when you ask the question, why would the scientists do that, even if you were you know, doing something like that, because this is probably something that's going to lead to grants, to certain, certain kinds of applications, etc. Et so there's a certain sense of power that comes to do this. Right. So that's my this is, has social implications, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we were talking about how these social facts often often are inherently political. Um, anybody disagree? Anybody think that this is inherently so they the fact that this virus with five mutations is transmissible between mammals is that is that just basic research? Yeah. We were saying that it's more the publication of the research that's political and not the research itself necessarily. Hmm. Interesting publication, the communication. So again, coming back to this um, interpretation. 
Um, yes. So, so I think that this is much more about uh, hubris and risk estimation than it is about politics. Mm. All right. I think that the controversy emerged because a lot of us thought that it's just hubris to say that their, that their containment protocols are adequate mm. when they, you know, there, there's no way to know that when the downside risk here is, you know, I mean, Europe, right? It yeah. could be billions. Yeah, so yeah. I would play devil's advocate. Mark and I had this discussion uh, as well, but um, in a similar way to scientific communication going through peer review before it's actually communicated, um, there are ethical guidelines, there are biosafety control, uh, controls, so there certainly were panels that reviewed this research and determined that, um, that this work fell within biosafety level three containment. Um, it's, it's interesting, the two perspectives, um, so the epidemiological community um, is worried about the vast capacity for this sort of virus to spread, whereas the molecular biology community that works in vaccination is really um, concerned with the actual identity of the virus itself, um, both of which have value. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so it seemed like, like the, from our conversation earlier, uh, that the epidemiologists were like, Let's look at how these viruses actually could play out in their social context. If they did escape the containment of the lab, where the uh, the virologists were like, no, let's just play, you know, within our lab with these like highly powerful uh, pathogens. Is that, is yeah. that right? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess I would draw the analogy again. I, I mentioned nuclear fission, right? So potentially not inherently political to do that research, but the political implications are vast. Um, uh, we, we can learn things, possibly, from... There's no question you can learn, but, but the, the, but is the closest analogy I know in my recent life is in arguing with BP about the technologies in blowout preventers prior to the Deepwater Horizon event. And there was the same exact level of hubris when a single mistake in your calculation, not, you know, that's not the same with nuclear fission, we actually have to start a research program to make a bomb, right? Here, one mistake in your calculation has the potential to kill a billion people. The hell with those people. One of <laughs> So this, this kind of goes back to what was said earlier about, like there's power in defining the risk, right? So like who gets to define the risk of the situation at, at hand? Um, and there's sort of like these institutional processes that are involved in a research institute that are, uh, define risk, but that doesn't necessarily take care of like the, the wider implications. Um, so there was a hand, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, we thought that um, if, we're, if we're going back, I think we have to go back uh, several steps from publication to just the structure of funding of science that has made this political because funding with NIH grants and funding with Pretty much any government associated grant has the information dissemination um, portion saying you, uh, if this is publicly funded research, it has to be made available to the public in some form. Uh, that ha what, who defines that form and who defines access to that form? What's the final product? So defining the public good, yeah. basically. Great, great point. And I would also say that funding that goes to this research is certainly funding that's not going to other research. So. Um, Conducting research probably is inherently political if it if it comes stems from government funding, right? It's it's not a it is a zero sum game in this case. Um, okay, um, appropriate response of the scientist, the virologist in this case. Does he or she he in this case stop his research? Does he continue to communicate it outside of the um, the science outside of the peer reviewed community? Um, does he wait and see? Thoughts. Well, this, this, was, this was a man. <laughs> Terrible question. <laughs> I guess I'm not really understanding the question. He, is he supposed to not report the... I guess what I was mostly interested in is essentially do... Um, is it okay for scientists who are silenced by a peer-reviewed community to communicate through other other agendas. Um, there was a discussion this morning um, about some research that's been communicated 
outside of, of peer-reviewed fields because they believe that the peer-reviewed community has, has silenced them. Um, is that a viable argument or, um, or do, we, do we trust these institutions? I mean, this isn't answering that question, but it is bringing it into like a more politicized view is like the silencing of EPA research and just communication about environmental research due to inherent political like implementation. So then I think there is something to be said about not setting a precedent of those in power structure being able to decide, but perhaps how concentrated the power structure is. Yeah. But, because I think it would be easy to say like, oh, the appropriate thing to do is stop. And I, and I think that's fair, but highly qualified by the amount of tr trust placed in like the size and authority uh, in the field of those people asking. Yeah. Can, can I so, ask you a yeah. very good example? Yeah. 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 Point of that is not because of the issue, which is just so dangerous that the theory is going to be able to do it in a slightly public fashion, just that it wasn't going to be able to work on this. Right. So that, that seems like two totally, on the one hand, you have really important research that's also very risky and has no complications, and the government has a lot of choice to do it. Right, so I think that's a great point, um, if anybody couldn't hear that, um, essentially distinguishing between um, this idea that something was rejected because it's um, for political reasons, because, uh, well, either because it's untenable research and just not, not hasn't been um, scientifically validated, um, which, depending on the academic uh, political climate, might be viewed politically, or whether this is actually like a matter of national security. So certainly there are um, a number of reasons that research could be silenced that we should be aware of. Um, and then finally, um, there were a variety of different news sources. Um, so um, any particular thoughts on um, some of the more biased sources in those articles and how they're able to, how it's, uh, how you're able to identify them? Yeah. I think more of a comment, a sideline comment on the third point, which is uh, that what drives the media is viewership, number of views per article. So uh, whenever it presents some information, they have to present it in such a way that is attractive to the audience. And oftentimes, they tend to uh, present in a way that is, um, I guess, a bit controversial or trying to present both sides in a slightly exaggerated way in order to drive audience to read the article. Yeah, um, and I think a good example of that, the NPR article, right, actually said if you want the other point of view, go talk to uh, Mark Lipschitz at Harvard University. Um, so very clear that they're presenting this debate, which has been um, part of the confusion regarding the climate uh, discussion. So we should move yeah. on. Yeah, I was thinking actually we might distribute both of the remaining key studies at the same time. At the same time? Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, so our, our last, last two case studies, uh, one has to do with climate change, um, and the other is to do with the, uh, the proposed march. Uh, on, well, it's not proposed; it's ongoing um, on science. Um, so that the article of climate change sort of focuses on the Arctic. Uh, the, there's, there's three there's three articles that are excerpted. Um, the first just covers uh, a, a meeting that the Obama White House convened in September 2016. Um, where they were bringing together scientists, diplomats, uh, politicians from around the circumpolar north to talk about Arctic change. Um, the, the second article uh, focuses on uh, uh, 
town, sorry, not town, it's like a little hamlet in the Arctic uh, who is uh, facing um, uh, coastal erosion uh, and are going to have to move. Uh, and then the third article uh, just came out a couple days ago, and the title of it is White House Proposes Steep Budget Cut to Leading Climate Science Agency. Um, so what I'm interested in here is like, how can we think about um, the science of climate change as a political thing in different kind of registers? Um, and then the other one has to do with the March on Science. So do you want to? Yeah, talk? sure. So um, you'll get some text actually from the March for Science website, um, their mission statement and core principles, and then a couple of articles that you've probably already seen. There's an op-ed in the New York Times that's been circulating. Um, about a um, coastal geologist um, who said the March for Science is a bad idea because of uh, its uh, the, the implications of politicizing science, um, and then just a more general news uh, news source citing some pros and cons, including Rush Holt, our former um, uh, former House representative, who is very much in favor of um, science being. Uh, science, uh, public advocacy for science. So, um, so scenario two is the one that Mark mentioned, and then scenario three is um, these. So we'll take four minutes <laughs> to talk about both of those things. Um, oh, sorry, just a second. Okay, so we have like uh, five, five minutes uh, left. Um, so, are there any questions about the, the, the articles that you read, just for questions of clarification before we jump into discussion? Can I just ask, just out of my own personal curiosity, the situation with climate change in the Arctic, have, have, is that a story that is familiar to people? Like, is this kind of like uh, already on your radar? Okay, a lot of heads nodding around here. That's good. I was just curious. Um, are you all ready to talk again? I, I, I'm just on the uh, March, the March thing, the March paper, the, the yeah. stories that you put together. They're really interesting in that it's. You're, it, I feel like what you're, you're, what these articles are talking about is the politics of marching, not so much the underlying thing that you're marching for. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it, am I did I read that correctly? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it comes back to this, this sort of discussion about facts versus the communication of facts, right? And in this, the form of communication that's been chosen in this circumstance is is a march, so that that's, that's political. Um, yeah, and so what does that, does that undermine science um, as a discipline, or uh, is there a way that we can make it compatible with, um, with sort of a rigorous scientific um, process? Does that, Sort of get what you're asking. I, I, I think, I think one, of, one of the issues, one of the issues, is that um, science has power in our society. One of the reasons it has power in our society is because it can speak to the world at large, right? But then the, the risk is, is that, or the anxiety is, is that if scientists start taking on a position of advocacy, then that undermines the credibility of their ability to speak impartially about the world. And so, is that a is that a valid concern? Uh, so, like, so some people would say having a politicizing science and, and having a march, uh, it, it, it risks undermining the credibility of science. Um, so, I think that's part of like, part of a larger anxiety. Why do you say that science is power because it says these truths about the world, and not because it knows connection with technology and other ways? Because I'm trying to sum up points in a very short period of time. <laughs> I don't want to get into Bruno Latour right now. <laughs> Strategic assumptionism. Um, yeah. Isn't it that the, uh, the march is a response to the fact that science has been universally politicized in our contemporary setting, that it's been rejected and it's been reframed by non-scientists as always just another form of politics. And that scientists are trying to regain the narrative somehow, regain the upper hand by saying this is what 
we do, this is who we are, this is what, this is, these are our methods, this is why we should be trusted. Um, the problem with it being a march to do that is that a march just looks like every other kind of political action. Uh, so there is a kind of ironic problem that it just makes scientists look like what they're being cast to be. But speaking as someone who's not a scientist or an academic, um, I think most people who aren't scientists don't really know anything about science um, or care what scientists have to say about anything. So making it a march sort of forces the discussion in a way that, I mean, maybe you could do it differently, but I don't know. Are you the other idea in the op-ed was some diffuse one-on-one -on -one type, yeah. it's somehow apolitical, but also trying to break down the political situation. And I don't know if that's really feasible, but it's kind of not really the country. You have to have like scientists trying to you know, just mm -hmm. make a case for science. Yeah. <laughs> we should have science classes in high school. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that would do it. History, too. <laughs> so that, that comment was just that, um, yeah, that, that in addition to marches, that, yeah, one-on-one -on -one interactions would be another method. Um, so I guess I was curious about the second point, so which kind of builds on this. The March for Science is happening, um, and rather than debating whether it should happen, um, I think it would be um, constructive to think of ways that we can make it particularly effective. Um, are there concerns about it under, undermining science um, as a discipline? And if so, how do we <coughs> alleviate those concerns? Um, people who are not in the scientific discipline, are there um, ways in which you think it could be made to more effectively humanize science? Um, are, there, are there risks in, um, inherent in its messaging? Particular concerns. I really like the phrase that you had, uh, regain the narrative, but it's kind of like about regaining the narrative and about um, sort of making making that narrative public, right? And sort of like, so I, I don't know, I, I feel like, like scientists are now at a point in which they're like uh, I, compelled by what they're seeing going on in the political sphere to sort of speak out about um, how it has been politicized. Um, yeah, I think the biggest risk is doing nothing because it's already been politicized. Now we have to regain some of the, the narrative and control over where things are headed because right now it's in a bad direction. Yeah. Um, so we're getting close to the end here. I want to just jump back to this. Is, is climate science political? Does anyone think the fact that, you know, like here in like the, the southern, like, in the United States, continental United States, we're emitting like greenhouse gas molecules that go up in the atmosphere, that kind of like do their work, that then have like uh, uh, these severe impacts on people that are not proximate to us, that kind of like undermines their uh, uh, you know, ability to live in a very real way with like coastal erosion, sea level rise and whatnot. Does anyone think that that is a political fact. Like, is is the science of climate change in and of itself political because it changes how you think about the world or the world in which we live? Or can we still try to like distinguish fact and, and, and value? Maybe we could say it's an apolitical problem that requires a political solution. That's the whole issue. Need yeah. Countries to agree on how to fix it and that it exists, and of course they can. Yeah. You have to. You have to speak up. Yeah.
So it, so it is a political thing, then, what I'm hearing you say. Uh, so we, have, we kind of like have to wrap up, because I think there's another uh, workshop going on in this space. Um, are there any kind of last minute thoughts that people want to shout out? Sarah, do you have anything? No, um, many things, but um, I would just say um, we were hoping to come up with some um, positive action items regarding the March for Science and ways that um, we might uh, make a Princeton representation that's going to be particularly um, effective uh, and helpful and having a diverse uh, diversity of inputs from people um, in the community and people outside of science and people inside of science and everything in between would be um, fantastic. Um, so please put your name on one of these many lists that are circulating. Um, I think we'll have a Google Doc um, circulating and uh, hopefully follow up with further meetings uh, if I'm interested people to, to sort of build on this and move forward. So thanks so much for all of your time. Thank you. Thank you.